Um, this is the 100 meter um, dash competition in the 2011 World Championship. And if he can correctly anticipate the status scan, that would put him into an advantageous position because he could leave his uh, position early and uh, maybe finish first. But as you know, um, sometimes these predictions can go wrong. In fact, he was disqualified from this race uh, because he was starting too early. But anyway, I mean, it should just illustrate that if you can take, take advantage of these predictions, that will, um, in fact, give you some great advantage, uh, great behavioral advantage. And it must be uh, very high because uh, even in such important competition, the athletes take the risk of being disqualified. Okay, so it's, it's clear that uh, this prediction of these events give you take, um, advantages in, in behavioral performance, but less clear are the underpinnings. So um, it is not um, well studied if these um, improvements in performance are due to improvements in sensory processing um, or more improvements in the decision stages which are typically thought to occur later than the sensory processing. And we basically addressed this question in the framework of signal detection. And um, we asked subjects to see this um, discrete interval motion, or to do this discrete interval motion detection task. And what um, we used were these random dot patterns that have been introduced yesterday. And our subjects basically saw a sequence of these patterns, um, one after the other. They were brief uh, random motion stimuli separated by a gap. And in one of these um, brief presentations, we embedded a target signal in a designated direction, like for example here, a certain percentage of dots moving into, to the right. And the task of the subject was simply to look at the sequence of stimuli and to press the button whenever this target signal appeared. And before each uh, session of this motion detection task, we measured actually the threshold of the subjects so that we could um, um, make this task hard and have enough false alarms and enough misses, basically. Um, as soon as the subject gave a response, so either like a correct detection of the target or a false alarm, we would terminate the sequence and the subject would get feedback. Also, if the signal appeared and the subject didn't respond, uh, the, the sequence would be terminated and the subject would get feedback. Um, this is basically how the task looks, looks like. So this would be random motion, random motion, random motion, random motion, and then a signal to the right. And this signal is much stronger than what the subject actually saw, and there was also not this uh, bound around the stimulus. Um, okay, so what we didn't tell the subject was that we manipulated um, target predictability in different uh, blocks. So in one kind of blocks, um, we I'm sorry, and we, we manipulated this target predictability by um, choosing different hazards rate, hazard rates. And these hazard rates uh, is, gives you basically the probability that something will occur given it hasn't occurred yet. So in different blocks, we um, chose the interval in which the target would appear from two different distributions. So in one case, we would choose it from a uniform distribution, which will give rise to an increasing hazard rate. So in this case, as time goes by, the target will become more and more likely to appear. In fact, if you have passed six intervals without any target, it, the target must appear in the seventh one. And in the other um, kind of blocks, we drew the target interval from the geometric distribution. And um, this distribution had the same mean as this uniform distribution, so a mean of four. And uh, with this geometric distribution, the hazard rate is essentially flat. So, in this case, the, um, the past doesn't tell you anything about what is going to happen in the future. And from now on, I will use this, uh, I will use the term increase in hazard rate for this condition and constant hazard rate for this condition here. Okay, so we first looked at um, effects of this uh, hazard rate manipulations on um, response accuracy. And what we found, um, this is data from a single subject, is that with the increase in hazard rate, the hits of the subject, the hit rate of the subject would increase, uh, whereas with a constant hazard rate condition, the hit rate would be more or less flat. So now, how about false alarms? Uh, if we also plot the false alarms, we can see that along with any increase in the hit rate, also the false alarm rate increases. And here, false alarm rate is flat. Um, we can 
now if you plot the, the hit rate against false alarm rate you, and we denote the interval, the data for each interval with a number, you can already see that in this um, increasing hazard rate condition, the intervals tend to lie on this, um, on this line here of a constant D prime. And it already suggests that people are shifting their criterion along these intervals in this condition. Whereas here, um, the subject, I mean, these data just are clumped together in one point. Said that in the in, in, in the case in which the hazard rate is not constant, the past does not tell you anything about the future. That's not quite true. I mean, if you just look at number six. Well, here, sorry, in this case. Here. Even, 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 even there, if you just look at number six and there was no signal, you guaranteed the probability one that it's going to be. No, sorry, I, I didn't say that. So, um, in this case, if we drew a number greater than seven, from this uh, distribution, we just had a no-go. So the subject was rewarded for not giving any response. Okay, so even in this case, I mean, in the seventh interval. The, okay, and uh, sorry, I, I missed that. And um, here I'm only showing data for six intervals, maybe that's important too, because in this case, uh, there are, you can't uh, make any false alarms anymore in this increasing hazard rate condition for the seventh in interval because the target will always be there if you have past six intervals, okay? So this is only data for six intervals. Okay, so, um, yeah, as I told you, this already suggests that maybe subjects are shifting their criterion uh, in this increasing hazard rate condition. Um, we explored this more formally and used signal detection theory to analyze these data. And here I'm plotting the criterion and here the sensitivity. And the solid line is the increasing hazard rate condition and the dashed line is the constant hazard rate condition. And as you can see, uh, if we just look at the criterion in the increasing hazard rate, the subject lowers and lowers and lowers the response criterion. Uh, whereas in the constant hazard rate, this is fairly flat. And here there's not really a systematic effect on the sensitivity. And uh, this was also true for our, like the average across our eight subjects that we measured. Um, so again, in the increasing hazard rate condition, hits and false alarms increase with interval. Um, the, these, uh, if you plot them, hit rate against false alarm rate, the intervals lie along this line with constant D prime. Things are more or less flat in the um, constant hazard rate condition and the data are lumped together at one point. And then if you, if you um, calculate the criterion and the sensitivity, you see that in the increasing hazard rate, the criterion gets lower and lower and lower, whereas it's flat in the constant hazard rate. And here there was no really significant effect, neither main effect of the hazard rate condition nor main effect of the <laughs> interval or an interaction. So um, it seems from this data that when you can predict or when the target becomes more and more likely, what you do is adjust your response criterion. Yeah. Okay, so this was um, data on response accuracy. So. This task wasn't designed to be a reaction time task, but we also looked at reaction times. Um, and it was, uh, I mean, nicely followed just automatically that um, the subjects in the um, increasing hazard rate condition also got, got faster and faster and faster <coughs> with each interval to give their response. Also, we didn't instruct them to be as fast as possible. Um, whereas in the constant hazard rate, the reaction times were flat. And this was also true for the, um, average across subjects. So this is only plotting reaction times for hits now. If you look at false alarms, you can see a similar pattern. Again, for the increasing hazard rate conditions, uh, reaction times decrease with the interval. Uh, and that's also true for the false alarms, um, flat for the, for the constant hazard rate condition. And this already, again, indicates that, I mean, you don't have, in this case, you don't have any sensory evidence, but you still get faster and faster with each interval. So it already indicates, again, that maybe what you're doing is shifting your response criteria and being faster in general. And in order to test this idea um, more formally, we um, used the, or we analyzed our RTs in the framework of this later model. And the later model um, stands for linear rise to threshold with ergodic weight. And it has been developed by Carpenter and colleagues. And um, this is basically the model. So you have a sensory stimulus that has an onset. And this onset triggers um, a decision signal to rise from a certain start level 
to a certain threshold level, and once this decision signal then crosses this threshold, it triggers a response, and that would be your reaction time. So from stimulus onset to the crossing of this threshold, and this would be your response. So we now asked um, if we, uh, how does this stimulus predictability that we vary, how does it affect the distributions of RTs, and what does it do with the, with the parameters of this model? So you can imagine that maybe changing the stimulus predictability could influence the slope of your decision signal. That would be one idea. So, and that would be maybe more, constant, uh, more consistent with an increase in the information supply. Uh, alternatively, uh, stimulus predictability could also affect the distance to thresholds. So just an offset, how, much, how long you have to travel until you reach this decision bound. And um, the, this framework is, is very nice because it, um, it, it can disentangle these two possibilities, basically. And in order to understand how, how, what kind of predictions it would make for the reaction time distributions, we have to go a little bit into detail here. So because, um, because the slope of this decision signal um, is Gaussian and it's inversely related to the reaction time. So steep slope gives you short reaction times. It means that um, your distribution of reaction times, uh, the inverse of your distribution of reaction times should also be distributed in a Gaussian way. And you can visualize this, uh, um, this, this transformation by using this kind of what is called a reciprocal plot. And here the abscissa is basically the reciprocal of RT of reaction time. Um, but plotted in the reverse direction. And the ordinate is uh, the inverse of a, a normal cumulative distribution. And with these transformations, you turn a Gaussian into a straight line. Okay? So this is uh, the representation of the inverse of reaction time, Gaussian in a straight line. And this, this representation has two important parameters. One is the median, which is basically, um, because it's a Gaussian distribution, it's just the reaction time at which this, um, this line crosses the z-score of zero. And it has this infinite time intercept. And this is basically, you can think of as the proportion of trials where this decision signal never reaches the threshold. And typically, it's very, very low. Okay? So, now, when you, um, these plots you can use to disentangle these two possibilities, how target predictability could affect your, um, could affect your reaction time distributions. So in, if, you, if you change the distance to threshold, if, or if target predictability would change the distance to threshold, what it would do is cause a swivel of this, of this line around this uh, infinite time intercept because this infinite time intercept is basically independent of the threshold. So, I mean, if you if you never reach it, it doesn't matter where this threshold is located or this distance from the start level to the threshold. Um, on the contrary, if you if you change um, the slope or the mean of the slope of your decision signal, what it will do is shift this whole curve um, to the left um, because the slope here of this curve is independent of. Um, this, uh, the mean slope of this decision signal. Okay, so now we can, we, we have understood this plus, we can, we, can, uh, we can plot our reaction time distributions in this way and then try to distinguish between these two alternatives. So um, what we do, do now is we fit the layer model to our reaction time distributions um, across the six intervals in the two conditions. And uh, we basically fit two variants uh, that have the same number of parameters. So in the swivel model, we fit one mean of the slope, one sigma of the slope of this decision signal, and we allow for different delta s, so different offsets between start and threshold for, the, for each interval. And then in the shift variant, we allow different slopes of this um, decision signal um, for each interval, um, we have, but we have one sigma and one distance to threshold. Okay? And we use a maximum likelihood estimate of these parameters, and we evaluate the model superiority um, based on the difference in log likelihood. Okay, so this is our distributions of reaction times for the different intervals um, plotted in this in this form, basically, in this reciprocal form. This is the increasing hazard rate, constant hazard rate, and the intervals are here color-coded. And uh, what you can already see in this, um, I mean, this is the interesting condition, what you can already see is um, that 
with this increasing hazard rate, the reaction time distributions change in a systematic way. And it looks like they converge to one point here and they fan out at these very short reaction times. And you can see that, I mean, this is interval six and then comes interval five, four, three, and so on. And now when we fit the later model, this is what the fit reveals. And this Vivil model basically gives you a good description. So any distribution of reaction times you can um, fits very nicely to the, to the fit of the model. Um, and this is uh, the, the Swivel variant here is um, more appropriate than in the shift model. Okay, so basically I'm done. <laughs> this is my summary. Uh, I tried to address the question how do expectations affect sensory decisions and I looked at two um, parameters of the responses. So one is accuracy and uh, we found that in the framework of signal detection basically target predictability does not affect perceptual sensitivity but rather the bias of subjects to respond. Um, and um, yeah, any change in the response accuracy that we observe overall can be attributed to changes in the response criterion. And then we also looked uh, in a separate analysis at reaction times and found that our distributions of reaction times can be well described by a simple rise to threshold model, this later model. And uh, what target predictability affects is this distance to threshold, not so much the, uh, not the rate of information supply, basically. And um, I mean, while these, uh, these are two separate analyses on the data, um, it, it's it was very nice to see that they basically reach the same, or come to the same conclusion here. Okay, thank you very much. So the drift diffusion model, I think, um, I mean, what is, is mostly applied to two alternative first choice tasks, right? So this is a detection task that's different. When we wrote, I, I think in the meantime, while we were writing this paper, um, there was a, a new paper that also applied the drift, drift diffusion to a um, detection task. But it, I mean, we were too early basically to, uh, yeah, put it. Because I think that the kind of distribution that you get with the diffusion model is they're very similar, like long tail. I mean, I don't know whether, I mean, they're not something like, like inverse Gaussian, but they're very close hmm. to that. Yeah. Maybe, I don't know, uh, some of you know more about the, like, this new paper where, where they applied the drift diffusion to detection task, but, yeah. Thank you very much for moving. Oh, I was just wondering, how long does it take for subjects to realize the hassle rate? Yeah, so we, I mean, we never tell them explicitly. Um, we always discarded the first session because we didn't want to have, like, these transitions uh, um, included in the data. We wanted to have them in a stable. <laughs> stable trial, but I, we haven't studied it. So in one session, you don't, basically you don't get enough trials to really track it, um, track the progression. And you have to imagine that in the first interval, you have lots of trials, for and then as you go into the task, you get less and less and less trials because there are trials that terminate earlier, basically. So within a single session, you wouldn't get enough data to really distinguish between these possibilities in, with this design. But I agree that it's an interesting question and it relates to what Bruce showed yesterday that maybe switching these strategies can take some time. Um, did, did you ask the subjects if they relied on agencies? Um, we didn't ask them. Um, sometimes, I mean, yeah, no, we didn't really, systematically <laughs> at least. Uh, yeah. I mean, one thing that they notice is different is b because in some in, in this in the in the constant condition has a great condition, you have these no goals that don't happen in the so so we tell them there is look a slight difference, but the only thing that's different is this um, yeah so they realize that something is changing, but I don't know if they are aware of this temporal um. Thank you very much for keeping on mm -hmm. time.